Hey, what's going on? Jeff Lerner here. And in this video, we are gonna talk about leadership. Before you roll your eyes, uh, I'm going to first uh, try to convince you, if you're not convinced already, that leadership isn't just some cliche term. Um, and that it's not something that comes later. It's a thing, it's a very specific thing that you can start with and it can produce a lot of really wonderful effects in your life. In other words, it's not like, oh, well, I'll become a leader when these things happen or I'll, I'll prioritize leadership once I'm in a leadership role. No, leadership is a way of being that you can take on right now in your life and really positive things will come from that. And uh, then after I sort of explain leadership, why it matters and how it can really impact you in the short term, uh, I'm gonna actually give you seven specific tips, things that you can do right now to become a better leader immediately. Not, not things that take time and you have to grow into. These are decisive, uh, fast results, things that you can do right now and see immediate benefit in terms of leadership and ultimately outcomes in your life. Okay, let's dive into it. Okay, so leadership. Uh, again, not just a cliche, not just a, a power word, but like a really, really important strategic thing that A, you should prioritize right now if it's not already, um, B, that you should be very intentional about. You should be doing things specifically for the purpose of developing and demonstrating better leadership because out of total self-interest, you will see better results in your life very quickly from doing so. And then I'm gonna give you, as I said, seven specific things that you can do right away to uh, establish a, a, a footing of leadership in your life immediately and start to see those results. Okay, so first let me start with a little story. Back in, I wanna say 2015, I started my, uh, my di I had a digital agency I started in 2013 and it grew uh, pretty big. We had over 50, uh, 50 employees at one point doing, I think we did uh, about over $25 million in, in the course of that business and I sold it in 2018. So made the Inc. 5000 multiple times. Like it was a good, it was a good company and for me, you know, I was a, I, an ex-musician who, frankly, I, I, I love working from home. I like, I don't like to like go to an office and manage a big thing. Um, and so it was kind of a big deal that I like did this company and it was a little out of my comfort zone to like start a, a real business where people came in every day and I had to like lead and be seen and hold meetings. And so I had to like really develop that ability very quickly. Uh, again, it wasn't kind of natural to me. I'm like a jazz musician. I like to be in my practice room working on stuff and go do the gig and be in my head and make music and scurry home without like having to talk to that many people. So uh, I had to really like learn how to do this and how to inspire people and how to, how to lead a charge and how to execute a plan and how to hold people accountable without making them feel like I was their, you know, oppressive, uh, parent or, or teacher, like it's a, it's a skill anyway, is my point. And it was a skill that I learned and it paid massive dividends. And I remember in 2015, so I started in 2013, it was about a year and a half into that business. And we had kind of, we were in this really small office when we started and we had a team of about eight or nine people. And that was like busting at the seams. It was a thousand square foot office. And we were ready to like graduate. I had, I had my eye, I remember it was March of, so it must've been March of 2015. We've been in business about a year and a half. I had my eye on this other spot that I wanted to move into. Uh, it was about 4,500 square feet. If I remember, we ended, up, we ended up expanding. It ended up being about 7,500 square feet. But at that time, it was a 4,500 square foot office. And I was like, if we move into that, I could grow my staff to probably 30 or 40 people. And we could really step this thing up. You know, at that time, we were doing like, I'm going to guess maybe like fifty to $75,000 a month. But I realized I had, I had a plan. Like if I could just expand the sales floor and add this new product that we could grow this to like a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. And, you know, we ended up going well beyond that. But at the time it was like this big thing for me, but the problem was it involved recruiting and training and managing more people. And even at that time, like eight or nine people, I had a really good uh, assistant who helped me with operations. And she frankly managed the group more than me. I just kind of still got to sit in my little my little nerd cubicle and come up with ideas. And she would do a lot of the, the dirty work of like implementation and execution. But, but in order for us to take this leap, I knew that I was going to have to step up. I was gonna to have to start to actually be like a decisive, visible, inspiring leader. I really had like a tough moment where I was like, you know, this won't work unless I become this person. And I had to like will myself to do it. And I can say now, 
And so I started reading books. Um, first of all, I started reading, you know, books. I started reading like books on military leadership, books on business leadership. I read, you know, from good to great. All these books on like how to interact with people in a positive way and ultimately lift people up and build teams. I read tribal leadership and it's just all about how to build teams and grow into this person. And I mean, I would go home, like literally, this is how pathetic it was. I mean, it's not pathetic, it's just what you do. I, I would go home and I would practice holding meetings in the mirror. So I would like get in the mirror and I'd be like, okay team, this is what we're gonna do today. This is our plan, this is our goal. You know, this is, this is our, our rallying focal point. Like, why are we doing this? What are we truly, really trying to do? And I started, I, that was the first time I developed like a mission statement and a vision statement. And yeah, I'd heard all these terms before and I kind of gave them like token attention, but it was like time to actually get serious and do this stuff. And I can report that over the course of the next year, we did in fact move into a new space. We did grow our staff from eight or nine people to well over 20 people. So we basically tripled our company. We grew our revenue. I want to say by the end of that year, we were well up above a quarter million dollars a month. So we, we, what would that be? Quadrupled or quintupled our revenue. And, and I would say most critically to that, I literally became a different person. And it was one of the best moves I've ever made. And since then, I'm not saying I'm like ready to storm the battlefield and, and lead troops, but I mean, I've made leadership a priority. I've made communication a priority. I've made empathy a priority. I've, I've intentionally focused on learning how to be better with people. And it has been the most dividend paying, life transforming, game changing decision that I've ever made. The reason it pays such dividends in your relationships and really across every aspect of life is because the number one rule of leadership, that this is the first tip, so now I'm gonna give you seven tips, this is the first one. The number one rule of leadership is service. It's actually leading servant leadership. You lead people by serving them. You lead people by empowering them, by putting them in positions to win. You lead people by helping make them better in their own roles, in their own lives, in their own uh, contribution to whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish together. And that's why it pays such huge dividends across all aspects of life. If I go into a meeting, let's say I go into a meeting with my accountant. I'm not, I'm not the leader of my accountant, my CPA who does my taxes, does my bookkeeping. I'm not as lead, like formally, I'm not his leader, right? I'm his client. But I try to go into that meeting saying, how can I conduct myself in this meeting to make him a better CPA? Well, that changes everything. You don't go into that meeting going, what, you know, what have you got for me? Show me what you've done. Make, take my mess and clean it up and fix it. No, you go into that meeting trying to be prepared. You go into that meeting trying to be organized. You go into that meeting with intent, trying to make it clear what your expectation is so that they can more effectively meet your expectation. You go in there trying to be the best client that you can be to empower them to be the best CPA, the best service provider that they can be back to you. Let's say that you hire a personal trainer. You go, well, they're gonna lead me. They're gonna lead me in my journey of fitness. No, well, how about if you go into every session trying to empower them to be the best personal trainer that they can be by being the best client that you can be? How much better is that gonna help you meet your own goals? You say. I want to make this personal trainer look good, feel good, and perform well. Look, well. look well, feel well, and perform well. It means I'm going to follow their meal plan. I'm going to do what they say. I'm going to show up with enthusiasm and energy, and I'm going to get enough sleep, and I'm going to be the best customer, the best client I can be because I want to, I want to lead them into success, right? Well, at the end of the day, what's going to happen? You're going to get in better shape, right? Your goals are going to be better met by helping them, by approaching it with an aspect of, of service. And you know, the, the book that sort of encapsulates this, uh, there's actually a lot of books that encapsulate this, but, and I'm gonna name off a couple of them through this, this conversation. But one of them is, I mentioned it already, Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. And Simon's like a, a genius dude. I've actually met Simon multiple times and I just have a high regard for him. He's a super humble guy, but um, he tells the story of how when he went out to, uh, he studied military, he studied coaches, he studied teachers and, and professors and business leaders and CEOs. And he was trying to figure out what makes good leadership. And he said, when it really clicked for him was when he was talking to a general in the Marines, I believe it was in the Marines. And uh, they, were, they were like at, at the commissary waiting for the food and all the soldiers went first. And, and the general told him, he said, we eat last. Like the generals, the leadership, we eat last. And Simon said, it clicked, leaders eat last. That's part of it. You, you empower, you literally nurture 
at the, at the food level, you nurture the people that you are leading before you nurture yourself. And, and so as far as an immediate benefit, what this means is if you want to become a better leader, you don't have to wait to be in a position of leadership. We all have opportunities for leadership all around us because we all have opportunities for service all around us. Just go serve someone. You immediately make yourself a better leader by just simply stepping out in an attitude of service. Even if they're a service provider to you, serve them by being the best recipient of their service. Like I mentioned, we all have opportunities for this every single day. The second tip, the second thing you can do immediately to become a better leader and to proactively engage leadership in your life is to start asking better questions. Leaders ask great questions. And I did not invent this idea, by the way. I, I absolutely swiped this idea from Brene Brown in her book, Dare to Lead. She, really, she, she harps on this over and over and over. Probably shouldn't use the word harp because that's kind of like a negative word. She, she reiterates this idea over and over and over. What is a great question? Well, and, and actually, literally, I Googled it. What is a great question? What makes a great question? And there's, not surprisingly, a zillion different answers. Um, in fact, asking what makes a great question is actually a pretty great question. question um, as I, as I found out, because I found a lot of really rich, detailed and instructive answers. Um, but what makes a great question? I would, I would simply reduce it to a few, a few things. You know, first of all, what, great questions have great answers and great answers are things that are, that produce great value, great impact. And so a great question is something that where the answer actually matters. First of all, I think we can all agree. Great questions don't have yes or no answers. But the next thing is great questions are questions that people are going to love answering. And I actually swiped that idea from How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, which I'm going to reference again here in this conversation. But great questions are questions that make people feel good in answering them and that allow them to expand. This is how I think of a great question. When I ask somebody a question, you can, you can literally see their energy. When their answer feels like an expansion of themselves, where they, they share probably more than they intended to, um, and they get into a deeper layers of meaning than they probably expected based on the context of the conversation, you know you're asking a great question. And I go into conversations now, like, you know, I, I reference this, this comment all the time that people forget what you say, they forget what you do, they always remember how you make them feel. That's from Maya Angelou, right? With my experience, the best way to make somebody feel something, feel something unexpected in a conversation is to ask a great question. And you know when you nailed it because they lean in, they get more excited, their energy lifts up, and they end up going longer and deeper than they probably were expecting to or even then was probably appropriate in the context of the conversation. And in terms of practicing things that you can do, this is just from my own experience, again, as a natural introvert, somebody that naturally would, you know, left to just purely my instinct, I would rather the conversation just go ahead and wrap up. I'd rather just kind of like close the, close it, close the loop and just go home and be by myself. Like that's my purely basic instinct is to kind of shy away from deep engagement. And so I realize that's not a very productive or, or, you know, pra practically effective way to be in this world. And then in fact, most of the things I want in this world come from kind of pushing myself out of my comfort zone and trying to do the opposite. And so I've, I've sort of strategically learned to try to have better conversations. And what I found is, as with so many things, we can absolutely pin ourselves uh, to paralysis by trying to perfect it, by saying, well, I gotta ask the perfect question. Honestly, the way to ask better questions is just to ask more questions. And eventually you kind of develop a, a feel for better questions. But if somebody's looking for a place to start, just start asking questions, just ask more questions. And usually questions will naturally layer down, they'll layer deeper. So like, you don't have to put all this pressure on yourself to be like, man, I gotta come out of the gate with the best question ever. You could start with somebody by being like, well, what do you do for a living? And they say, oh, you know, I'm a, I, I build cabinets and I install cabinets. Cool, how'd you get into that? And they tell you how they got into that. And then you're like, okay, well, what's, a, what's another layer, or another follow-up question to that? Well, that's pretty cool. Do you, do you have kids? And they say, yeah, I have kids. Have you started teaching your kids how to do that? That seems like a good opportunity to maybe, you know, create a connection with your kids. Kids like to build stuff, right? Oh yeah, cool, cool. Have you ever brought your kids with you on a job? Uh, yeah, and that's a yes or no. So maybe go, okay, I gotta, I gotta quickly follow that up. Cool, what was that experience like? Did you get any feedback from them? Oh yeah, cool, cool. Um, you know, so they answer that and say, man, have you ever been to your kid's school? I'm like, bring your parent to, to work day? 
or, or bring your parent to school day? Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you bring any cabinets? Did you let them like build and do stuff? Yeah, yeah, cool. So what's that like for you to have a, a business where you, it's so experiential? Like, do you love that? Do you love what you do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, my point is, follow the thread. Follow the thread. Don't be jumping around. People, people love talking about themselves, asking great questions and try to get into the meaning. How did you get into that? What does it mean to you? Get into the why. You know, great leaders, Simon Sinek's book before Leaders Eat Last was called Start With Why. Leadership derives from the why, getting into why people feel, think, and behave the way that they do. The next tip is developing your voice. And I say that literally and figuratively. So literally, I mean actually develop your voice, like get better posture, take deeper breaths, do exercise, do breath control exercises, like take a lighter and practice Practice a slow, steady, controlled tube of air such that the flame flickers, but never, you see it flickering, but it never goes out. See how long you can do it. Practice mm, getting like pure resonant sound that vibrates in your sinuses. Try to feel mm, all the way up to the top of your forehead. You wanna feel the bones in your face vibrating. Like do things and go, like Google it, read it. How do I develop a stronger speaking voice? At the end of the day, leadership is about communication and most communication in a leadership context happens verbally. Some people are gifted with this. Why did George C. Scott get cast as the role of Patton in the movie? Because he had that gravelly voice, like vo vocal power and inflection matters. But if you wanna be a better leader, start developing it. De build it just the way you build you know, a muscle if you, were, if you were trying to pursue an athletic objective, but also figuratively, developing your voice figuratively, which means Figuring out who you are, what you have to say, what you believe, how you have to say what you believe, how what you believe infuses what you say about anything. Getting to the point where when people say, oh, he's such a passionate leader. You know, what they mean is whenever he speaks, he or she, you can feel their energy. You can feel their belief. It suffuses everything. They could be talking about everything. Think about the book. I don't know if you've ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's a book and a huge amount of the book is about a guy talking about uh, Robert Piercig, who's the author, talking about how he takes care of his motorcycle. But yet, the entirety of the book feels a certain way. There's a certain energy, there's a certain set of beliefs, there's a certain ideology, and there's a certain approach to life that's woven through these extensive conversations about how you take care of a motorcycle. That's what I'm talking about, developing your voice so that no matter what you're talking about, who you are infuses the conversation. You couple that with actually developing your voice literally, mechanically to project and resonate, your leadership will go through the roof. And how would you start doing that immediately? Start doing it immediately. Literally, Google how to improve or how to, how to strengthen your speaking voice, get in front of a mirror and start speaking to yourself in you know, implementing what you learned about how to, how to enhance your voice and speaking to yourself and asking yourself constantly the question, is who I am constantly infusing what I'm saying. The next tip is actually demonstrating self-respect. So I mentioned back in some, uh, spring of 2015 when I, I wanted to kind of turn that corner. Now, one of the things I didn't say is at that time, I was not taking particularly good care of myself. I had been working a lot of hours to get the agency up and running. Um, I, I like to kind of go into my hole and do my work and come up with my ideas and write my scripts and create my processes. And then I would just hand them off to uh, my operations assistant who ultimately became the COO of that company and she would kind of implement. I was sort of hiding and, and playing small and being my like kind of quirky, weird little introverted self. And I wasn't like working out and I wasn't like getting haircuts regularly and I wasn't shaving and it wasn't like some cool, well-organized facial hair and like a stylish longer haircut. It was just basic lack, like unkempt lack of self-care. And when I decided that like, hey, I wanna actually start leading people, I wanna start you know, inspiring people to a cause, the first thing I had to do was lead myself into better self-respect. And so I started working out again, I like started grooming, I started getting more regular sleep. I basically demonstrated self-respect physically. And I remember you know, over the course of several months, months later, people actually talking about how Part, you know, we, we transferred, we moved to a new office, we engaged new products, we started selling more, energy picked up in the office. And I remember people actually saying, one guy in particular, 
um, who was an MMA fighter. So he was like very attuned to that sort of thing, but he also worked for me in sales. And he was like, man, we could really see how you were transforming, how you were changing as part of the larger change that was happening with the business. And it was really cool because it, it sort of made tangible what it was that we were a part of. That like things are getting better, things are growing, things are improving. Literally, I had one of my salespeople say that my improved self-care transferred over to improved energy in the business. And maybe that's a little bit almost pedantic example of what I'm talking about, but I promise you it's the truth. Taking better care of yourself is contagious. The next leadership idea that I wanna talk about actually comes from one of my favorite books on leadership, which is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Um, you've probably seen Jocko, he's kind of a big influencer personality now. He like wakes up every morning at four or something to go work out and he always takes a picture of his watch and posts it to say like, look how early I am, look how I'm up so early. And anyway, he's actually really, I think he's, I really like him and he seems like a pretty cool dude. But uh, this book was really powerful. One of the, it actually had so many amazing concepts and um, you know, one of them is the, like, you know, you get freedom through discipline. I love that idea. Like the more disciplined you are actually, the more free you become. Uh, the idea that I wanna share as sort of an immediate implementable tip for leadership is to, he talks about preparing with the worst case in mind. Prepare for the conditions under which you ultimately might have to perform. So like in a battlefield context, that's why they simulate bombs exploding and bullets flying and, and people screaming and yelling. That they practice in those conditions because so that when you get in those conditions, it doesn't shock you, it doesn't disrupt your training, right? But in general, I believe that the idea is that when things are easy, you wanna actually make them harder. So that when things actually get harder, they'll feel easier. And, and I think that's one of the greatest lessons for our society that like we need to hear is that we should actually consistently be trying to make things harder because things have gotten so easy. As a society, it's been so long since most of us, the, the, the middle mainstream element of society, since we've actually been tested, at least in the United States where I live, like. The last time that the, the broad swath of people were really, really pressed and tested was like the Great Depression. I was talking to my parents about this the other day because they were, they were like, yeah, you know, in our, in our lifetime, I don't know that we've ever been tested. My parents were born uh, in the baby boom right after the World War II, late 40s. And they're like, I just don't know that we've ever really had it hard like our parents did. And I, I believe that too. I'm, I'm in my 40s. I know I've never had it that hard, but I try. I try. I try to make things harder so that when things do get hard, because you know, for all of us, things get hard sometimes, they actually don't feel as hard because we've been simulating battlefield conditions, so to speak, in our own life um, so that we're prepared for whatever comes. Anyway, I kinda, I kinda took that from extreme ownership and I think that's something we can all implement immediately. Like go do something hard, literally. Go run up a hill. Go give money that, that strains you. Maybe give money to somebody, donate to a charity. Go uh, take time that you don't feel like you have and go serve somebody. Like just go, go uh, put yourself out there publicly. Go sign up, you know, join Toastmasters. Sign up to give a speech. Um, go talk to that pretty girl that you've been intimidated by. Just do stuff to make things harder and do it now. Do it immediately. It'll make you a better leader. The next thing that I want to uh, talk about with leadership this isn't something that you would actually implement by doing, it's something you'll implement by committing to not do. And it's actually, it's a pretty great hack for life in general. Never argue, just make a decision. I'm never gonna argue. Wear a rubber band around your wrist and snap it every, every time you start to feel yourself wanting to argue, just never argue. Always find a new way. I mentioned Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He says in his books, the only way to win an argument is to avoid it altogether. Great truth about life. Just simply don't argue. Make that decision. You know, from a leadership perspective, there's nothing more unbecoming than somebody in an argument. Think about it. Think about how people look when they argue. Like you're gonna, you're not gonna follow that person. That person is taking themselves down a notch in terms of perception and reputation by being seen as an argumentative person, even if it's not your fault. The key to not arguing is to realize it's not about who's right. Because if you have a need to establish who's right, then you're already trapped in the trap of arguing. If you're in your mind, you're like, well, well yeah, but I, sh I should be able to make my case because I'm right. Okay, you're already in the argument. It's not about being right. You know, my therapist says, would you rather, he says this to couples all the time, would you rather be right or be close? Human connection is deteriorates, it's destroyed by argument. 
So if, you, if your goal is to win friends and influence people and lead people and build cool things and assemble teams and achieve objectives and have a great life, go on a, on a, a cold turkey fast forever on arguing. I promise you'll be glad you did. And finally, the final, the seventh tip on becoming a great leader right now today is to go learn something. In the book, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, John Maxwell talks about, he has these different laws of leadership. And one of them is the law of process. And the point is that leadership is a process. Leadership is about layering on knowledge, experience. You, you, you get knowledge, you get experience implementing the knowledge, and that creates opportunities for you to get more knowledge, experience, implementation, or I guess it's knowledge, implementation, experience, knowledge, implementation, experience, and so on. But it always starts with getting more knowledge. So immediately, what can you say? Well, I don't have an opportunity to implement, but, but implement what? You know, right now watching this video, you actually do have an, op an opportunity to implement because I just gave you six pieces of knowledge about things you can implement. This one is the seventh. Go learn something. Obviously, you're, you're already doing that. You're watching this video. But every day, say, I'm gonna learn something because then I'll have the opportunity to implement it and gain experience, and that'll open a door to another piece of knowledge that I need to learn. But if you make a commitment to learn something every day and then actually go implement it, you'll be constantly engaging in the law of process and becoming a better leader every single day. There you have it. Seven things you can do to become a better leader right now today, along with a framing of why I really believe this is important and how it's paid massive dividends in my own life. Uh, by the way, I mean, I'll share this with you. You know, if you follow me online, by the way, this is actually, let me interrupt myself. If you like this, please subscribe to my channel. I would humbly uh, appreciate your subscription and supporting me in this mission. My mission here is to literally make life more awesome for as many people as possible by sharing everything that I've learned from over two decades as an entrepreneur, failing in some massive uh, disastrous ways and also some succeeding in some pretty wonderful ways. But most of the success that I've had has happened since 2015 when I decided to make leadership a priority. I am speaking to you from the guts of my own life about how important this is. Anyway, if you have a question, I'd love to hear from you below. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. I'd sure appreciate that. And again, I invite you to subscribe. Make sure that if you subscribe, you click the little bell so you're notified when new videos come out. Thanks again for your time. Thanks for supporting me on this mission. And I will look forward to seeing you on the next video. Take care.